everyone. Thank you for joining us for the final panel in the 2024 Teacup Conference, Decolonizing Ukraine in Theory and Practice. Um, I'm so pleased to see so much sustained interest in this conversation, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion on this panel. For a final time, I want to remind you that we have, in addition to our in-person audience, a large virtual audience, we're being recorded. Please do silence your cell phones. Um, and all our sessions have simultaneous interpretation into Ukrainian. If you're listening on Zoom, the link is in the chat on the webinar. So our final panel is focused on Ukraine itself from the perspective of Ukrainians. We kind of called it Ukraine's domestic policy, um, but I think this is really the panel that's going to give us the chance to dig deeper. And I want to give a special thank you to this panel's moderator, Lena sorsko Um, She's actually someone who I've been talking to about this conversation about how we decolonize policy and political studies since 2019, 2020 is when that conversation started. So this has been a, a long conversation. Um, and her input was actually really influential in thinking about how these panels should be in conversation with each other. Um, so I really thank you for all that time and energy and thank you for moderating this final panel. Joining her as speakers are Alexei Goncharenko, who is a member of Parliament of Ukraine. We have... Next, we have Volodymyr Kulik, associated now with Columbia University. Mariam Nayem, who is an independent researcher and podcaster. And Olga Skripnik from the Crimean Human Rights Group. Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for your shout out. And thank you, of course, for organizing this. And I know we lost, but definitely not the least. And I think I, I like the analogy of peeling the onion right? That was used early in the conference, and we sort of the heart we got there, right? Um, and of course, to um, use Dora's phrase from last, uh, from yesterday, from her great presentation, we have the audience, we have four mics, I got four Ukrainians. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm super excited to have this conversation with each and every one of them. Uh, so again, as a reminder, four questions, four speakers, hour and a half, and we'll open it to the audience after. So without further ado, here we go. Uh, through the conference, we've heard many perspectives on decolonizing, and I would like to know what decolonizing looks like for Ukraine's do domestic politics and policy. And from your perspectives, um, what is the most important policy area where decolonizing is necessary inside Ukraine? Um, have any steps towards the decolonize de decolonizing process have been taken? Uh, prior to full-scale invasion or since then, have there been successful? And what do you think are the major obstacles or challenging for decolonizing in that area or not? And I'm asking you only for one policy. I wanted to ask five. So thank Emily for curbing my enthusiasm. <laughs> um, so we'll start in the order in which you are appearing in the program. So Alexei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for a great possibility to be here to all organizers and for invitation. It's a big honor for me to be in Harvard and uh, to take part in this conference, I think, which is very important. And I see so many people interested in, and uh, that is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think that when we're like, usually when we're speaking about decolonizing of Ukraine, we're speaking about uh, like process of derusification, de-imperialization, uh, change of names of Ukrainian cities, streets, uh, we're speaking about many, many things connected to the fact that for centuries, Ukraine was part of empires, different empires, not only Russian, but Russian, but Austro-Hungarian and, and, uh, and so on. So that was like, this is a usual context in which we speak. I think that after February 24, 2022, it's not any more interesting. What do I mean? I think that Ukraine showed to the world that we decolonized ourselves. We did it. That's the history of success. In general, I think that we have two wars. We're speaking about the Russian war against Ukraine. I would divide it in two wars. The first war, war for independence of Ukraine, or for decolonization, you can name, or another war. And this war is already won. We did it. It happened in February, March, 2022. That was the moment when Ukrainian nation changed and the world changed its view on Ukrainian nation. And the most important, 
Ukrainians change their view on themselves. That happened. Now we have the second war on territorial integrity of Ukraine, and we don't know how long will it last. Uh, but it's another part. We are not today, I'm sure, we can't, uh, there is no chance for Putin to destroy Ukraine as it is, as he wanted two years ago. Exactly these days he was planning this attack. He failed. And that, is, uh, that shows us that decolonization of Ukraine already happened. But when we're speaking, we're using the word colony, and we're speaking about colonization, usually, yeah, what do we mean? We mean that it's the territory which is dependent. And people who live on this territory, they do not make decisions for themselves. Yeah, there is a met metropoly which influences. But I think also is a very important part of the second part of decolonization process, which Ukrainians should go through. And we are on our way now. That is about Maya Hata Skraya. My house is a site. This is a famous Ukrainian proverb saying that like, I deal with myself, or we can call it Hutar, like a small village, Hutarianstva, meaning that Ukrainians often like, are, are seen as those who are having a great, like their, their own house, they're making something in, in their house, they have a garden and so on, but they live in a very, they're saying, what's happening on the other side of the lake, it's not about me. On the other side of the pond, it's not about me. I, that is my home. I am, that is my fortress, everything is great here. What is there? I don't know. And I don't want to interfere. I think that is something we need to change. And that is something when Ukraine, we just because of our standing on the map, because of the geopolitics, because of our neighbor, unfortunately, but we can't live like this. We need to forget this, Mayahata Skraya, and we need to become so my house is a site. No, we are in the center of the world's geopolitics. We are in the center of the most important processes which are happening right now. And that means that we have these huge challenges, but also a big responsibility and big opportunities. That's something we should, which we should acknowledge. And by this, to find our place, what are we giving to the world? What we want the world to see us Dear courageous, yes, independent, but what more? I believe that Ukraine should be the frontline unit of the free world. We have all possibilities for this. We showed our courage, we showed our commitment to the values which are important for the whole free world. And what is very important, we are ready to fight for it. I just came here last week, I was in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and there, uh, I spoke with one European ambassador to Council of Europe, and this lady told to me, if our country would be attacked, we would surrender. That was said to me by ambassador, acting ambassador, not former, not expert, by acting ambassador of the country. She said, we would surrender. And that is something which Ukrainians are not doing and will never do. And that is so important. And that is something we can give to the world and to show that we, we believe not only that we are independent <clears throat> on our land, but we also can influence the world around. I think this is very important, and this is the next step of decolonization of Ukraine, which we need to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. And might I say, right on time. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you for organizing this amazing conference. Uh, and it's always good to be back at Harvard, uh, definitely uh, in, in this auditorium as well. Uh, so, but it's hard to be talking uh, right after the politician uh, because uh, you know they are talkative by definition, you know, and uh, and they they, they, they don't are. they don't need topics, you know, they they, they need audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but professor. Professors are a little bit like this too. <laughs> too <laughs> professors do believe that they need topics, yeah. Uh, and so this conference is about such so, so general topic that uh, I'm a bit at loss. But uh, Alexei and I uh, did not uh, did not agree to disagree, uh, unlike in the previous panel. But I I'm, uh, I will be doing my best uh, uh, to to be true to my professional identity. Yeah. So disagreeing with politicians. Uh, so. 
um, I will be I will be talking first about what we, what has been done, and then focus on on, on what what I believe needs to be done. Yeah. So obviously, uh, and here I agree uh, that um, uh, there are some achievements in decolonization, uh, not not just for the last two years, uh, not, not even just for the last. Uh, 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 10 years, but, but for, for the, uh, some uh, are long lasting, so some are slow in, in delivery and uh, actually in, in, in the, in the work on that started uh, from the beginning of independence. But most impressive, impressively, uh, we have changes uh, since February 22. Uh, the most obvious is um, the removal, I would say, of the pro-Russian forces from the political scene. We, we, we've had this plague uh, with us uh, for three decades. We had Communist Party uh, sometimes strongest in the parliament. We, we had the Party of Regions, uh, which uh, uh, did represent in a way a certain region, but it, uh, it also dragged that uh, region behind uh, uh, and, and toward Russia. Uh, and uh, there, there, there were its most recent uh, reincarnations, the opposition bloc and opposition platform for, for life or whatever it's called. Uh, they're basically gone. I believe they, they will not reemerge. There, there, there might be something uh, which will try to, to play into this um, uh, pro-Russian Soviet nostalgic sentiments, but they will never uh, make it a cornerstone of, of, of their message. Uh, th that's not what they want to be identified with. Uh, so they, they, they would try to use it, to exploit it, but they will not, they, they, they will not uh, want to be based, uh, not, not, not want to be based uh, identity on it. Uh, so that's a huge achievement and we should not underestimate it. Uh, second, there are, related to this, obviously, there are no longer any oscillations between pro-Russian and pro-Western vectors in foreign policy, most obviously, but also in security policy, in economic policy and cultural policy. So uh, it's um, a competition between different measures of pro-Western or we, we could say Ukraino-centric. Yeah, so uh, more radical, less radical, but it's, but it's, it's not a competition between one day we are voting for, for uh, uh, association with the EU and next day we're voting for some measure of integration into the European Union, uh, Eurasian Union or whatever post-Soviet uh, structure. Uh, one day we are, we are voting for, uh, for uh, uh, promotion of the Ukrainian language. Ne next day we, we vote for something which gives Russia uh, uh, basically the same rights as, as Ukrainian language, and so on. Uh, so uh, the, the era of these uh, uh, oscillations is over. So Ukraine is moving uh, in a kind of uh, one direction, which is actually uh, two directions at the same time, two tracks of the same direction. Uh, Ukraino-centric, meaning a certain national identity and, and centrality of, of predominance of, 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 of uh, Ukrainian uh, identity and culture. And as, on the other hand, it's move, movement toward Europe, uh, towards the West, uh, So, which is definitely good. Uh, the third uh, uh, relation related to this is that um, uh, we, uh, we see the decolonization of Ukrainian cultural space and, and linguistic space. Uh, more, more radical in terms of renaming uh, or, or removing the monuments, uh, less radical in terms of changing uh, established patterns of cultural life. Yeah, so uh, our uh, 19, uh, 95 portal, Quartal 95, uh, is no longer uh, 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 joking about ethnic Ukrainians or, or, or Maidan. But, 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 but they are still uh, kind of uh, referring to the same patterns of a pro-Soviet pro person. So cultural patterns, cultural tastes do not change uh, overnight, but, but they are changing. So there is movement in that direction. And there is definitely a promotion of the Ukrainian language uh, stronger than ever before. Uh, so that's that, that that's a very important uh, a very important thing. Again, we need to be careful how how not to uh, uh, not to, uh, to fall into an, uh, an opposite extreme, uh, meaning the uh, uh, discrimination of minorities, uh, uh, disrespect of the of the uh, uh, linguistic human rights. But uh, the, the the obvious thing that decolonization of Ukraine is impossible within the centrality of Ukrainian language is no longer uh, in debate. Yeah. Uh, so now to what we need to achieve yet, to, to what, we, uh, what we did not achieve to, to such an extent as, as, uh, uh, as I would like. Uh, so the most important area where decommunization is needed is policy making and the political process, where a lot of colonial, uh, essentially colonial patterns of corruption, nepotism, paternalism and authoritarian persists. 
So this is something which is not normally associated with, with decolonization. But I believe it is equally important and maybe more important than, uh, than decolonization of cultural, uh, cultural space of, or, or, or uh, derasification of, uh, of, of foreign policy. Uh, so the war made these patterns of corruption and, 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 and authoritarianism even more unacceptable to the majority of Ukrainians. But at the same time, it made them uh, less visible. Or, uh, and uh, uh, more uh, more difficult to combat, and 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 because the uh, active uh, active forces of Ukrainian society are focused on the fight in the external enemy, and they do not uh, uh, do not want to be distracted toward fighting this internal tendency. But I believe I believe it is very important that uh, uh, we continue in that direction because that's something that uh, that empire left. Uh, in our thinking and our patterns of behavior. And I believe uh, uh, maybe Moya Hatas Krayo is, is, is a pre-colonial pattern. It's, it's, it's indigenous Ukrainian pattern, but definitely, uh, but, but definitely uh, uh, corruption is, and authoritarianism is deeply uh, related to, uh, to, to, to what, uh, uh, tightly related to what empire uh, did to us. Uh, so what has been done to overcome this legacy uh, has resulted not less from its external pressure than from internal uh, uh, domestic opposition. So the main obstacle is ob obviously, as I mentioned, the war itself. Yeah, it, 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 it cha channels all the resources and all the thinking in, to, towards, the, to, toward fighting the external enemy. But I, I believe uh, we need continued movement toward liberal democracy and away from post-Soviet uh, paternal policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think I need to start with a couple of different topics. Um, I, I'm not in academia, but I also disagree with politicians, which I think in my case is kind of ironic. But uh, I think that we need to understand that Russian imperialism is about everything that is in Ukraine. It's a systematic problem and, need to, and we need to have systematic answer on all levels. However, I think that very important right now is education. Education, again, on the all levels, in the schools, in universities. Um, it is very important to rename uh, streets, to change our approach uh, to historical events. But I think it's crucial to do it systematically because otherwise we're just dealing with some symptoms of, of basically metastasis of Russian imperialism. We need to fight it holistic in holistic way, try to find a way how we can create new generation, new society that will not need to have decolonization. Basically, as Fanon is saying, is decolonization is basically creation a new man, and we need to create this new man. The way to creation this new man is education system. If we talk about education system, and of course I can talk about myself since I was studying in Ukraine and I was studying in Ukrainian school. Some basic question that all, uh, not all, I'm generalizing of course, but some kids in Ukraine are asking when they're studying Ukrainian literature is basically why all Ukrainian literature is about suffering? Why all history is so problematic? Why, like, why there is no um, good time for us? And this is, I think, very dangerous place because this has led us to inferiority complex, to the idea that something wrong with us, and this is basically favorite thing uh, for empire to do, to um, make us doubt in ourselves that there is some problem with us, that their problem is mayahata skrayu, but not with the subjugation for centuries. And this is the main problem, not in us. So this is. Mm, the reason why it's important to implement it in education to give the answer for those crucial questions that kids are asking, people in the in the universities are asking, because there are blanks. And if we're not filling the blanks, Russian Empire were, were filling their blanks and even doing it right now from different uh, ways of propaganda, because, you know, the propaganda is changing. It's not only in, in television right now. So if we're talking about some systematic good changes, of course, we can talk about this, like law, law about um, Holodomor, yeah, and, and realizing that this was genocide is very important step for us. Or renaming the streets or understanding um, and thinking, I just remember that next to my house, there was a small square of course you were, and it was very funny when I was 10 and I found out who it was that. I was kind of surprised that this guy in a funny hat is next to my house and he has still like some kind of monument. So I think it is still important. But I think it needs to be systematic because otherwise we are not creation long-term changes. We need to understand that decolonizing uh, will take a lot of years. 
since the process of colonization was taking a lot of years, we need to understand that this is a, this policy should be for cent not centuries. Oh my God, I hope not, but for decades for sure. I hope that when I will be, you know, 100 years, we won't talk about this. We will have another conference in Harvard about something else, but not this topic. What I think could be dangerous for us, um, I'm kind of, I think it's very important to highlight that our society make very important changes for our conscious um, with the revolution of dignity. This was the moment when we decided that that's, that's over. The idea of we are the same with Russia is over. This is this not this didn't start with 2022. It started much much before earlier. So I think that if we talk about the biggest problem um, in Ukrainian decolonization, we need to talk about political parties that were basically cooperation with Russia with Ru Russian corruption system and basically did everything that we will emerge with Russian culture and be the same. And I think for future, we need to be very careful with political system because we cannot create Ukrainian future with old political mistakes. Thank you. Olga? <clears throat> thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing fantastic discussions. So I am human rights defender. That's why I will uh, I will speak through human rights perspective. And um, as to the internal policy, we are speaking uh, about uh, reintegration as part of decolonization of Ukraine. And I share this approach because uh, reintegration explicitly means the Ukraine's responsibility for this process. And also the process should be focused on, uh, on people. And all policy, of course, are very important and all are facing new, now numerous challenges due to the Russian aggression. But the pivotal for all areas should be protection of people. For example, if it's about military sphere, it's protection of our military. If it's about uh, reintegration one, it's protection of all affected by the war and occupation. So uh, when the large-scale invasion uh, had begun, the national political course to liberate Crimea by political and diplomatic uh, instruments was sweepingly changed, of course, uh, because the territory of Crimea shall be returned by military actions now. And it's obviously the only realistic way to deoccupy Crimea. And that creates both additional uh, risk and opportunities. The getting on perspective of deoccupying Crimea uh, gives rise to many matters uh, regarding the ways and forms of reintegration of peninsula residents in the legal, culture, information, uh, educational uh, spaces of Ukraine. And 2021, the president of Ukraine approved the strategy of um, deoccupation and reintegration of Crimea. This document presents guidelines and prioritized aspects uh, for the reintegration, um, reintegration of Crimea. But with the start of the large-scale uh, invasion, the strategy was not revised considering the new challenges that arose in 2022. So therefore, Ukraine still needs to develop uh, and adopt a general vision for the reintegration of the occupied territories, including Crimea. Uh, after the full-scale invasion, of course, some steps uh, were done. For example, criminalization of uh, collaborationism, collaboration, uh, creation of the recovery reserve. It's reserve of officials who will work in the deoccupied territories and simplify uh, access uh, to Ukrainian education for children from uh, occupied territories. But we still have contradictory decisions because uh, there is no oral vision of the state. But good news, despite the Russian aggression, Ukraine continues to develop this strategic vision. Uh, about challenges, uh, of course, the main obstacle is the war, ongoing uh, attacks on civilian targets and a traumatized society. I think each of us in Ukraine has lost one or, or more close ones, relatives, friends, colleagues. And of course, this is the basis for constant manipulation and Russian information attacks. For instance, uh, attempts to split society over the issue of hostages, prisoners of war and civilian hostages. So, and one more challenge, I think we don't know, we don't know the 
exact scenario of how Crimea and other occupied territories will be liberated. Uh, what will these territories look like after Russians leave? Uh, and we have to prepare a strategy and take into account very different scenarios. And of course, it's not, it's not easy, but I think it's possible to work with this issue. Thanks. Thank you very much. So my next question is about responsibility. It is who is responsible for decolonizing? The society and politics, is it an individual enterprise? Is this a matter of civil society? What role do government and parliament play? Is there room for local governments or the so-called promadas? So. Thank you. <laughs> then uh, Volodymyr will say again, but you know, after me, so <laughs> we need to change the, the uh, yeah, uh, very important question, but is, uh, the, the answer is very easy. Everybody are responsible. I mean, there is no that somebody is responsible, you are not. That is, you, if we're saying it's a government responsible, it's the first sign that you are colonized. <laughs> That's so easy because like that is what does it mean you are not a colony. You are responsible for yourself. And if you want to be free, you want to be independent, you want to develop, do it. Do it. It's in your hands. And that's something just we, we, we definitely need to do. So I am representing the parliament. Do we need to do? Definitely. The laws, uh, which we number of where, which uh, the parliament uh, adopted, starting from decommunization, then deimperialization, uh, starting uh, like about uh, history, about uh, commemoration of dates, uh, and, and many about the status of Ukrainian language, about many, many other things which the parliament already did. But we need to continue, 100%, for sure. Then I said everybody should do their job. Like, I will give you one example. What, for example, I am doing now, and by the way, I am inviting all of you to join. In, on May 17, 19, we will make in Odessa big Black Sea Security Forum. I think that is about what I started in my first answer. S to start to see Ukraine as a wider picture. Not just Ukraine as Ukraine, but do you, I don't know, maybe somebody from you and don't realize that the biggest city on the Black Sea shore is Odessa. There is no other biggest city, no in Romania, no in Turkey, no in Bulgaria, even not in Russia. No one. You, oh, the, the biggest city of the uh, Black Sea is Odessa. The capital of the Black Sea is Odessa. The biggest ports uh, um, in the Black Sea are ports of big Odessa. That is something which is our unique opportunity. And we need to develop it. But we don't have such events, for example, today in Odessa. And we want to make them. The next, I think, it should be something happening in Lviv. And the next should be something happening in Dnipro. Kharkiv today is very difficult because of security issues, but that also very important. But we need to start to show that the capital of the Black Sea is Ukrainian city of Odessa. That is important to make conference there, to take people there, to speak about worldwide issues, food security, energy security. It happened that the food security of the whole world is dependent from Odessa, from the Black Sea. And from the, as from the times of ancient Greeks, the, the breadbasket of civilized world is the Black Sea and northern part of the Black Sea and Ukrainian territories and lands. That is important. We need to remind this. And that is important now because I think even Putin realized that he can't take Kiev, but still he wants to take Odessa. It's number one in his wish list from a number of reasons, geopolitical, economical, cultural, symbolical, historical, and others. But very easy to cut Ukraine from the sea, to, to uh, reach uh, Transnistria, to threaten Moldova. That's what is in his agenda. And we need to speak and we need to do it. So that's something which we are doing. Uh, one more thing you asked about Hromadas, you mentioned. That is also very important. When we're saying about, that's, we, we also need to be frank. When we're saying about colonization, Russian empire, and things like this, we should not forget that Ukraine is not a, like a textbook example of colony. It was never, has never, was, had never been. Never. Uh, like Khrushchev was the leader of Soviet Union. 
Uh, many others, uh, people, many Ukrainians were a crucial part of, of Soviet elites, a crucial part. That's why Russian Empire is so desperate now. They just can't be empire without Ukraine. That's why they are attacking. Because all, a lot of the army, if you will take army uh, and you will see who was the core of Soviet army, this were Ukrainians. The core of the uh, people, of younger officers, that's were Ukrainians who were the, the biggest uh, and best engineers, who were making rockets, who were pushing science. The, all of these were Ukrainians. And we were, yes, we were part of this empire too. And we also received these perceptions. Like, for example, on the, to do, what, what is one of the um, characteristics of empire? is a centralization, big centralization. And one thing was, I think, especially decolonizing, we're not speaking about it more a lot, but very decolonizing thing was decentralization in Ukraine. When the cities, when the communities received their responsibilities, when they started to be uh, independent in their decisions, and that's something which helped enormously to Ukraine after February 24, 2022. Because that is a war of Putin's vertical, imperial vertical, against Ukrainian horizontal between people, volunteering, communities, Romadas, that was our strength. But we also, that is a step, very big step that Ukraine made from being colonized mentally to being decolonized mentally. That was a decentralization process. Fortunately, all as, as you said, and you hear, there are challenges. For, for example, today we have centralization process in Ukraine, which is, I think, definitely stop, step in, in wrong direction. We need, to decentralize, to secure this Ukrainian horizontal, to develop it. And that is the place for everybody. I am finishing my answer. There is a place for everybody in this. For you, for me, we all should do our best. And by this, we will definitely achieve the goal. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your enthusiasm with uh, applause, but perhaps Let's wait until we're done with our questions with all the panelists. Thank you. So I was the last. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a minute. Go ahead. Hold it. I mean, obviously a politician, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but here I, I'm happy to, to be more in agreement with Alexei. Uh, so definitely there is uh, a space for everybody. Yeah. So it's common responsibility. And... Uh, Obviously, an active role of civil society and local self-government uh, is not only due to parliaments and uh, the central government's reluctance to take, take some radical steps. For example, like uh, ban Russian books or uh, ratify their own statute. Uh, but also due to uh, centralization and authoritarianism being one of the legacies of, coloniali of colonialism. Uh, so the government and parliament must must adopt laws uh, and regulations, but no less importantly, change their own mode of operation. Uh, the parliament needs to respect opposition uh, more than it does now, especially during the time of war. There is uh, this disturbing tendency that the rights of oppositions are neglected uh, and the speaker abuses his, his power. Uh, the uh, parliament at the same time needs to assert its independence from the executive more than it, it is doing now. Uh, of course, it's good to have uh, the president as a symbol of, of Ukrainian resistance, but at the same time, Ukraine is still a democracy and Ukrainians more it to be that way more than ever. As uh, is a huge percentage of Ukrainians who want Ukraine to be a democracy and be, be, believe that democracy is the, is the most important, uh, the, the most appropriate uh, 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 order, uh, uh, rule, uh, kind of rule in, 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 in Ukraine. So uh, that's a crucial uh, role for the parliament and the government to, to show uh, by, by its own example how democracy works. Uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, 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 local governments and hromadas uh, must overcome colonial legacy in their cultural landscape, landscape because it's, it's not yet done everywhere uh, in, 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 in the cultural practices. And uh, uh, at the same time, engage citizens in democratic practices of decision making and accountability. Uh, last but not least, civil society 
must pressure both central and local politicians uh, to overcome colonial legacies. Again, not only cultural legacy, but political legacies, uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 mental legacies. And uh, 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 also educate citizens why these legacies are bad, why uh, it is important to overcome them, and what forms they can take. Because very often uh, some practices are not, are not recognized as, as, as colonial legacy. As, as that's why fighting them is not recognized as part of decolonization. So civil society must educate citizens why it is the case. Thank you. Thank you. Mariam? They are disobedient. No, they, they are disobedient. Are they are disobedient. No, it's not, it's not just you. <laughs> but okay, we'll just take it as such. You guys are just so brilliant. They have yeah, clap for exactly. every, every one of your statements. Miriam, please. So uh, for my last year of work about decolonization, um, I had, the, I think, privilege to talk with Ukrainians, with everyday people, just about decolonization. Um, and uh, I want to share my experience about this topic because I think what is important that this topic need to spread from this perfect university, sorry, uh, Chichenko University, but this is also good. Um, and I think it's important to highlight where and how people are talking about. So for example, people were approaching me on the streets of Kyiv and asking me about decommunization. Um, some people were asking me at 11 p.m. in Helm, in going back to Kyiv, they were stopping me and asking me some personal question about decolonization. Uh, of course, like hundreds of questions in uh, my direct messages in social media. And even once, some random person called me at 10 p.m. just to try to understand what is decolonization. I, I didn't know how this person even had my phone number. But what I want to share with you, because I'm, since I'm talking to people about this topic, I'm collecting questions and I want to share some questions with you. So you will understand what exactly everyday people are asking. And it's like more grounded thing. So I will read that. So how can I read of the inferiority complex? Did the decolonized people manage to restore their cultural identity? How will explain the need of decolonization to my mom and dad? They love Soviet films how I can personally decolonize myself. What should I do if I like Olivia salad? <laughs> how, I should, how I should decolonize myself in food? I call my, my father Papa. I cannot use to another, to, to Tato. How I should decolonize myself? How I can decolonize myself in order to forget Russian language and how much time will it take? How I can, can get rid um, from, from this language? And how does decolonization affect self-esteem and self identification This is everyday question. And I think what is important for us to see here is like, society is ready. And I think more, more important question, can please all Ukrainians just like raise their hands? These people are decolonizing al already. This is like process already started. So I think it's kind of important to highlight that it's not like we need to create a spark of decolonization because people are doing their own work with their individuality, with the personal experience every day. And of course, we need to talk about that it's completely different. The process of colonization of Ukraine was completely different because Ukraine is huge and experience is super, like, very different. So each person trying to do something some people are trying to read more, more books. Some people trying to switch the language. Some people trying to cook another food, you know? I, I think what we need to create, we need to create the basis that will make this um, road easier, to make this right easier, to help them, because I think society is ready. Thank you, Miriam. <laughs> Yeah, good too. <laughs> I lost that battle, Olya. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks. Yes, I, I agree that it's space for everyone. I'm from Crimea originally, and from very small and beautiful city Yalta. So I have my personal way of decolonizing, decolonizing myself. So uh, and before occupation of Crimea, I had only one right decision to be Ukrainian. Uh, to teach uh, my students in Ukrainian. And that's why I was uh, coordinator of the Maidan movement in, uh, in Crimea, in, uh, in Yalta. So, of course, all of us can be part of this decolonization about Ukraine. I think it's very important uh, events uh, in February, because February and March of 2022 demonstrated the entire world that maximum solidarity of society and the state 
absolute trust in each military, in each civilian allows not only to survive, but but to turn the history around. And then nobody believed. But Ukraine managed to repeal uh, Russia. And similarly now, the further development of Ukraine it matter for each uh, of us and is possible without synergy of state and civil society, of course. This uh, synergy, I think, will be uh, unachievable without key reforms in Ukraine, as reform of justice and anti-corruption reform. And Ukrainian civil society is powerful and able to take responsibility. And for instance, in 2014, 2015, uh, Ukrainian's law enforcement system was unable um, to investigate Russia international crimes committed in Ukraine, in Crimea. At that time, only NGOs, only civil society collected evidence of such crimes, uh, which is now used in international uh, courts. Uh, it was only in uh, 2016 uh, that the investigation system began to build together with human rights defenders. Um, this resulted for instance, uh, at least uh, 15 communications to International Criminal Court on war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, committed by Russia and Crimea. Uh, so it's like one example. And all these uh, communications were prepared together with prosecutor office and human rights defenders. So similarly, civil society is now actively uh, involved in the preparation of uh, reintegration approaches. Uh, for example, it's demonstrated uh, by the International Crimea platform. Uh, this platform is only international platform for deoccupation and reintegration of Crimea with the particip participation of more than 60 countries uh, established in 2021. So the Crimea platform um, now is acting in three dimensions, governmental, parliamentary and expert. And the expert dimension is representative by uh, civil society. So officially, civil society is part of this Crimea platform. Uh, and I think one more point about Ukrainian parliament, for me, it's very important. Uh, of course, reintegration requires uh, legislation changes. Uh, and it's the parliament that should become a platform for drafting and discussing laws and for um, it, uh, further reintegration of the occupied Crimea and other occupied territories. But since the start of large-scale aggression against Ukraine, the Verkhovna Rada has become less open for civil society representatives. At the same time, it's very important because maintain connection between members of parliament, uh, parliamentary committees and civil society representatives is critical for addressing key key challenges uh, that exist in reintegrating the deoccupied territories, including uh, including Crimea. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question. My next question is actually about Crimea. So, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to switch the order, and I'm going to start with Olga on that question. Um, um, so. Um, this is a question for everyone, but I will start with her. And once Crimea is liberated <coughs> from the Russian occupation, what do you think are the steps? that must be taken to preserve the process of decolonization, as we speak about it in general for Ukraine, <clears throat> while reintegrating Crimea into Ukraine? And what policies must the Ukrainian government pursue toward liberated Crimea then to ensure decolonization rather than recolonization? Uh, so, first of all, I think decolonization policies should be um, based on the fact that Crimea has not become Russian, despite 10 years of occupation and Russian propaganda. Uh, Crimea residents resist Russia and support Ukraine. And currently, um, it's more, more than uh, 190 uh, Ukrainian citizens are political prisoners. It's about Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians now are in prison. Also, Ukrainian citizens are being persecuted in Crimea for their political views, opposition to the war and occupation, religion affiliation. The Crimean residents uh, now are being persecuted for any demonstration of pro-Ukrainian position, uh, even for singing Ukrainian songs. Uh, my organization collected this evidence and we documented uh, more than uh, 500 administrative cases against Crimeans. And many of them were persecuted for Ukrainian songs like Stefania or, uh, yes, Stefania, it's very popular reason for persecuted in real uh, Crimeans, it's fine or um, administrative arrest. Uh, Stefania or Chervona Kalina. Because uh, so-called uh, courts uh, decided that it's very dangerous uh, song uh, in Crimea. And Putin adopted a new criminal and administrative uh, article in 2022 
uh, called uh, discreditation of Russian army. And this article now, like official reason to prosecute uh, Crimeans for Ukrainian songs, like example. So that's why Crimea is Ukrainian, because we have Ukrainians there. Uh, it's first. Uh, next, I think it's very, uh, very important that Ukraine should be ready uh, to deoccupy Crimea now, not after deoccupation, but now. And Ukraine needs to know what it will do with, uh, for example, follow, follow issue, follow questions. First, restoration of Ukrainian authorities and very good that approaches are already being developed and recovery reserve is being formed for this. Uh, next, uh, Court, Russian court decisions for 10 years of occupation. 10 years of occupation. The Ukrainian justice system will not be able to review all these decisions. Uh, for example, all uh, those convicted of criminal crimes that will be a procedure for them. Uh, Russia uses torture, illegal methods of investigation, and convicts people for political reasons. Of course, we cannot trust Russian verdicts, but we also understand the criminal uh, crimes were committed uh, during the occupation. So that's why we need this mechanism. Mechanism will uh, have to be developed now, not after the occupation. Next, it's collabor uh, collaborationism, collaboration. Uh, so what important? Important to change approaches to bringing to criminal responsibility for cooperation with uh, occupational uh, authorities given ongoing occupation of Crimea. Uh, it's worth bringing to criminal responsibility the persons whose actions ensured the establishment of occupation regime or whose activities absurdly affected the state of Ukraine. But other Crimeans should be protected from such persecution. Uh, next, we need a strategy for educational integration um, of the occupied Crimean residents. A strategy should, um, should include a working out system uh, to overcome the difference between, between so-called Russian education system and Ukraine. Because Russian education system is totally about militarization of children and preparing these children, Crimean children, Ukrainian children to serve in Russian army. And unfortunately, now we have this many, many cases when very young people, Crimean people, now part of Russian army and uh, were sent to Ukrainian territory. And some of them died in uh, this war. Uh, next, of course, we also need to have a clear vision of how to overcome the consequences of aggressive Russian propaganda and its impact on the local population. Also need to develop legal procedure for civilian Russian citizens who illegally, illegally moved to Crimea after the occupation. And I think it's a very big challenge for us because according to minimum estimates, uh, it's uh, at least uh, 500,000 civilian Russians. What procedure, legal procedure for these people after the occupation? Uh, and one more issue, last but not least, it's civilian hostages. Uh, it's about Crimean political prisoners and about civilians who were kidnapped by Russian army in newly occupied territories in the southern part of Ukraine. It's about Kherson and the Parisian regions. Many of them were abducted by Russians and after they transferred to Crimea. And Russians uh, opened uh, two new detention centers in Crimea for these people from the southern part of Ukraine. So, and many of them have already been transferred to the Russian Federation, to Russian colony. Uh, and I am sure that as the Ukrainian army approaches, Russia will take all hostages to the Russian Federation uh, for, for further pressure Ukraine. So it's important today to develop mechanism for searching and returning these people. You know, I think about some process about Ukrainian children deported from Ukraine to the Russian Federation. So I think we need the powerful coalition for uh, all the civilian hostages for adults, because it's about thousands and thousands of Ukrainians <coughs> now in, uh, in captivity in uh, occupied territories or in the Russian Federation. So of course, it's not a complete list, but I think but all of these points should be, should be worked out now. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay. Thank you so much. Actually, it was, um, I think it was a very good idea that Olga will start this because, of course, like this topic is more yours. Um, I think it's also important to talk about um, education of people in Ukraine. 
specifically talk about Crimean culture. Of course, we can say that right now there is a lot of activists that are talking about this. There is a lot of um, Crimean culture in the popular culture, which I think is also very interesting because people are willingly want to find out about this culture. So, um, but to be honest, I think also that there is already some um, practice already involved in the Ukrainian political system that we can already start to think about reintegration and what we will do in Crimea. Um, we can also see that on different levels, also on like um, policies and also like personal. But I think, frankly speaking, uh, it's hard for me to talk about Crimea without talking about different topic. So every time I'm talking about decolonization with Ukrainians, I'm trying to emphasize one important thing. Decolonization starts with love. Love to your people, love to your culture, um, you need to have curiosity to dive deeper. And I can talk about love and decolonization for a long time, but what is important is to also remember what Fanon said. Decolonization reeks of red and hot and cannonballs and bloody knives. To decolonize ourselves, we need these red hot cannonballs and knives. We need weapon. To talk about Crimea, to talk about how we will integrate Crimea, how we will work with people, we need to have weapon to fight Russia. We need to decolonize our land physically with weapon. And I think after that, we can go deeper and be more detailed with what we need. It doesn't mean that we need to, don't need to do anything right now, but I think it's also very important to highlight all the, like this word will start with the moment when we have enough weapon. And this is very important for all of us right now. Thank you. Now I feel like I need to clap. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I'm all of them are go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You are you are disobedient. Uh, I'm a disobedient, disobedient myself. Disobedient I know. Your own rule. I like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are, these are Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, uh, so um, I'm I'm happy to agree with, with most of what what was said by the ladies before me. It's easier to agree with them. They're not politicians. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but I want to add one crucial um, um, uh, item to the list. For me, the main decommunizing practice uh, uh, measure in Crimea should be overcoming the legacy of discrimination and marginalization of its indigenous people, the Crimean Tatars. Uh, the Ukrainian state must not repeat, must not repeat its uh, post-1991 mistake of prioritizing the comfort of the settler majority over the rights of the indigenous minority. Uh, so, as a Ukrainian, I must repeat, it's not Ukrainians should be prioritized in the uh, liberated Crimea, but Crimean Tatars. Uh, many people believe that it should be, should be Ukrainians everywhere, in every part of Ukraine, and uh, without that, you, it, it is not Ukraine. But no, uh, in Crimea, it should be first and foremost about Crimean Tatars. So this means, in practical terms, Crimea must not be a territorial autonomy as it used to be, but it must be a national autonomy uh, of Crimean Tatars. Uh, Crimean Tatar must become one of its official languages, alongside Ukrainian uh, and Russian. Uh, as much as many of us don't like Russian, uh, as, as long as, uh, as a majority of the population there uh, are Russians, and probably most of them are, are, uh, are there to stay, uh, we, we should be uh, respecting their rights and, and, and recognizing Crimean Tatar, uh, Russian as one of the official languages. But Unlike it is the practice uh, we had before uh, the annexation, Crimean Tatar now must be a real official language, meaning you, you should have a right to use it anywhere uh, in, in, in any social domains on the whole territory of Crimea. Uh, and, and, and that, uh, should, that uh, right should be ensured by, by the duty of uh, public servants and service providers. Uh, to know and use that language in uh, in communication with their customers uh, speaking that language, and that that uh, that duty should be imposed after a short transitionary period. Of course, that practice would prior would would, uh, advent, uh, would give advantage to Crimean Tatars themselves, since, since mo uh, more of them know their language than than, than many others, which is good. Uh, which will give them the, the, their positions of power where, which they deserve and, and they are deprived of. Uh, so uh, uh, that will be a kind of a, a killing a bird, uh, two, two, two birds with one stone, uh, long live the birds. Uh, but in addition to that, we need to restore Crimea to the toponymy of the territory of Crimea. We need to remove colonial monuments on the territory of Crimea. 
we need to uh, to uh, uh, recognize the value of Crimean Tatar culture in Crimea and outside of Crimea, uh, across the territory of Ukraine. Uh, we need to educate Ukrainian children and Ukrainian citizens uh, in adult education and in the media about the value of Crimean Tatar culture and, and Crimean history, uh, not colonial history, we, we used to be taught. Uh, so these are all things very important. And w w without them, it is indeed uh, uh, going to be uh, re recolonization rather than decolonization. Uh, apart from that, there are, of course, other considerations. There is a strategic role of Crimea in protecting Ukraine from uh, from Russia on, in the Black Sea. Uh, there is role of Crimea as, as a seaside resort and land tourism site uh, and ecological preserve. Uh, 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 but these are less important in my view than uh, asserting the agency of Crimean Tatars as an indigenous population of Crimea. Thank you. Thank you, Volodymyr. Let's see, floor is yours. Thank you. You know, uh, I, I I want to have several hours more. I have so many I have so many to reflect on and 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 even to argue. But I think one thing is something which uh, is important for us to keep it. Ukraine is so inclusive, <laughs> and that is very important. And when I hear, why should I forget Russian language? I don't like the word should. Those who want to forget it. That's their right. Those who not not. Why we should say that in Crimea we should prioritize this culture, this culture, this culture. We need to give all possibilities definitely for Crimean culture, Crimean Tatars culture, language, everything else. But I want to see Ukraine as much inclusive as possible. And that is something because when you see this word should, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. This is empire. This is colonization, because the metropolis says colony should do this, people there should do this, they should learn this language, they should speak this language, they should do this or that. I, I don't like this word. I want Ukraine to be inclusive as much as possible. And really, I want to tell you, I think there will not be big problems with the uh, uh, restoration of Ukrainian control over Crimea, I mean, speaking from not a military point of view, after it will be physically uh, restored the, con uh, the, the control. Me, for example, I think much bigger problem with, will be with Donbass. Uh, that will be much bigger problem for us. And we need to speak about this. It's a different things, but I will explain you just one third, simple third. Just imagine you are a boy in uh, Donetsk. Now you are 18. 10 years ago, when Russia came, you were eight years old. For 10 years, the only thing you know about Ukrainians is that they are killing you, your fathers, brothers, grandfathers, and so on and so on. There is a lot of blood between us, physically. Fortunately, it's not the case with Crimea. Also, Crimea is not devastated like Donbass is devastated. That is something we should remember. That is a very big challenge, and that will not disappear itself. We will need to work on this, and that will be a hard work. Not so hard as to destroy Russian Empire, but it will be a hard work. With Crimea, I think it will be easier with just understanding of inclusiveness of Ukrainians. That is, was always our strong point. Always. Because so many nations on Ukrainian territory felt themselves like at home. Always. And that is something we need to preserve, secure. This is our strength. Don't forget one more thing. We have demographical catastrophe in Ukraine today. Last year, 180,000 babies were born in Ukraine. Uh, in 1990, I think, it was 800,000 babies born. Just compare these numbers. Millions of Ukrainians are abroad. And with every day of war, less of them will come back. Let's be frank. Ch children are coming to the school. <coughs> Ladies are finding spouses and, and opposite. Uh, and uh, even... All after our victory, Ukrainian lady which married German man or Polish man, they love Ukraine, they will come to Babushka, they will have, but, but they probably will not move to Ukraine, their family. Somebody, yes, but not many. It will mean that Ukraine will need people. And that will be not only Ukrainians coming to Ukraine. <coughs> many different nations, we will need these people to come. 
and we will need be to be inclusive to take these people into Ukraine. That will be after our victory, which I believe in. Ukraine will be very different country from what it was before the invasion, from many points of view, and we need to realize this. And we we can't take the patterns of Ukraine between 1991 and 2014 or 2022, and to say we will continue. We couldn't. That will be a little bit, and not a little bit, different country. And we need to find these trends, and we need to be inclusive, and we need. Yes, to reintegrate. But once again, I don't think there will be big problems with the reintegration of Crimea. Uh, that is a wonderful land and, uh, and that is a wonderful part of Ukraine. And I think that they will flourish, especially if Ukraine will feel itself, not just as a country, sorry again, but I'm saying this, but as a regional leader. And for regional leader, Crimea will be essential. And that will mean a lot for Crimean people, no difference what nationality they are. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we are coming on on the last moderated question of the conference. And uh, the question is the following, and it sort of feeds in into a lot of themes that we have raised through the last two days and in this last panel as well. And so, as you say, one of the main goals of decolonization is regaining and reasserting the agency, Ukrainians' agency, that unique voice. And arguably, President Zelensky has this policy about nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. And this seems to me like a great manifestation of that decolonization in practice. So in your opinion, has Ukraine been successful in asserting its agency and its voice? Is the world listening? And what is one thing that everyone in this room can do to serve the goal of decolonization? You know, just a tiny little question. <laughs> so, Alexei, I'm going to hand it to you. Uh, the, I think all we were speaking about here, that was about this, right? Yes. And uh, definitely, uh, I don't think that we, I need to repeat something of what I told. I want to tell you something different. And that is about, we all the time, we're speaking, and it's clear why. Because of our history, because of what's going on right now, when again this zombie empire, Russian empire, came to kill us, to take us to observers because they need Ukrainians, because they can't with, without, and so on. But let us not forget one thing, that ending our dependence from Russia should not mean to become dependent from somebody else. That is some, something very important to remember. And when I'm here, when, when I hear, I mean, like, we will we have difficult debates in country. I think they will be more difficult in the nearest future about what's going on, how everything will continue, what is our strategy, and so on and so on. But when I hear when some people, for example, here in the United States of America, saying Ukraine should give up Crimea or Donbass or anything uh, to Russia for because something, because to finish the war, I don't know. Oh, even not to give any land, but Ukraine should forget about NATO because Russia doesn't like it and we here are afraid. I'm sorry, what is the difference? Is it not a colonizing practice? What, what, what is this language about? How should anybody decide for Ukrainian people, what to do? To join NATO, not to join NATO, to what to do with our territories, how develop them. That's a hard decision, but only Ukrainians can make them. Only Ukrainians, that means to be decolonized. Oh, we can just from one uh, story, we can come to another story. Yeah, maybe softer, maybe nicer, but still. So that is important for us to keep this our right for our own decisions and even our own mistakes. That's something we should go through. And, and yes, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. This should be very important for all of us because I see how many voices are raising about and the, our allies and the United States is our ally number one. And we are very thankful for all support we are receiving. 
but should also respect our right to make our decisions and to support us in our decisions and also to fulfill their obligations. Because I just came, uh, uh, that's the finish of my visit to the United States. At the beginning of this week, I was in Washington, D.C. And I heard many disturbing voices and very bad things there. And I think that very quickly, a lot of people here forgot that to support Ukraine is not just a moral obligation. It's not just about charity or not charity. This is obligation of the United States of America. Because in 1994, the United States of America, together with Russia, took from us nuclear weaponry. And if we would have nuclear weaponry, never ever would any country attack us and destroy us and kill us like they're doing right now. They would not take Crimea. They would not take Donbass. Nothing. We gave up our weaponry. We gave up our third. And they said, except of this third, we're giving you shield. This is our guarantees that you will be secure. Where are these guarantees? Where is the shield? Or if the United States war doesn't mean nothing in 30 years, just. Is it really a country other countries can rely on? Is this the country which wants to be a global leader? Is it this just the right thing and honest thing to do? That's something we have all right to remember. We're suffering today because of decisions which were made 30 years ago. About Russia, everything is clear. But also it was United States of America which considered Ukraine to be unpredictable and it's better to give nuclear weaponry to Russia to control all of this in one hand. And now Russia threatens United States of America and the whole world that they will destroy the world up to the rubbles with the nuclear weaponry and the weaponry they received from Ukraine also. And Ukraine is fighting for our values fighting uh, against Russia, which is clearly saying this is the war against Anglo-Saxons. Putin is saying this. It's not the war against Ukraine in his head. That's the war against Anglo-Saxons. He says it openly. And at the same time, many things are forgotten. That's something I, I think we have a right to raise our voice, to, re to remind these things and, and to secure our right to make our decisions and being supported in their decisions with our allies, if they are true allies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have an opportunity to uh, disagree with Alexey again. Uh, it, of course, not about the agency. That, that's clear. First, uh, to his, uh, in response to his earlier remark, I believe that the situation when intellectuals are telling politicians what they should do is not a legacy of colonialism. It's, it's a practice of democracy. Uh, so uh, that's all right. Uh, second, uh, manipulations uh, is a weapon of politicians, not professors. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. surprised. Yeah, I learning. didn't say anything about. Uh, they are learning from you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, second, um, uh, I don't think that uh, the U.S. behaves uh, similarly or wants to behave with regard to Ukraine similarly to Russia. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, uh, the U.S. wants uh, to colonize Ukraine and, and to rule. Uh, 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 there was a great discussion about that in the morning. It, it, it's a pity you, uh, you, you, you were not there, uh, but you were not here. But uh, in general, uh, of course, it's a global, uh, it's a global uh, confrontation. Of course, uh, the U.S. has uh, strategic interests in all parts of the world, and unfortunately, in our parts of the world, or maybe fortunately, because if only, if uh, uh, as long as uh, as long as Russia was the only great power uh, having a, a strategic interest in our part of the world, we are in, we were in trouble more than than now, and uh, when uh, other global players also have a strategic interest in our part of the world, but and. Um, it is it, it it is it is not comparable. So we are uh, we are not in danger of colonization by America. We are still in danger of colonization by Russia, and and we are helped in that uh, by America. Unfortunately, not as much as we would like. Uh, that's one. Uh, of course, Ukraine has been uh, remarkably successful in asserting its agency. In, uh, in on the international arena in the last, especially in the last two years, but to some extent in the last 10 years. Uh, the world is listening to Ukraine more than ever before, or maybe more than ever since the time of Kiev and Rus. Uh, so uh, maybe historians will, will ridicule this statement, I don't know. Uh, 
uh, I'm looking at Vlahi and, and, and you'll tell me later. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, uh, Ukrainian, uh, you, 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 first and foremost, of course, this is due to uh, amazing resistance and resilience with which the Ukrainian uh, 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 responded to the Russian aggression and which the politicians and diplomats and intellectuals and cultural figures uh, translated into a measure of international recognition and appreciation of, of, of Ukraine's uh, heroic deeds. Uh, still, the main role of Ukraine currently in, in interna uh, on the international arena is that of a victim of Russian aggression. Heroic, heroically resisting, fighting back, uh, 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 kind of holding, but a victim. And this, of course, doesn't go well with the, uh, with the agency. Uh, so we should, we, we, should, we should understand that as long as we are primarily a victim internationally, uh, it's not so much about uh, respecting our agency as to uh, protecting our freedom and protecting our survival. And so we need to, trans uh, to transform this story of being a victim of a mighty neighbor, of, of a mighty aggressor, into being a, a, a contributor to global security, to global economy, to global culture. This is something we all need to do. Politicians, diplomats, intellectual, friends of Ukraine abroad. So this is something which will change the story of Ukraine in the world, and, and which will make Ukraine great in a sense it deserves to be. Uh, not in the state of great again, of course. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, and, and, and of course uh, uh, this, this leads me back to my initial point in the first question. Uh, that also means getting rid of, of, of these corrupt and incompetent practices in policy making, uh, in, in business uh, and culture, and uh, unfortunately academia as well. So each of us can help change Ukraine and disseminate, uh, uh, the, uh, disseminate uh, uh, the information, uh, the stories of Ukrainian success, Ukrainian overcoming bad practices, but also help combat these bad practices where we are in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sort of enjoying how you're disagreeing but agreeing with each other. This is really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam. Um, yeah, so I think firstly, of course, I would like to answer the question, but I also need to react because otherwise I will just explode. So uh, I think it's important to highlight something about Russian language. So um, when we're saying that we're not like Russia, that's why we should not ban Russian language. I think it's very slippery slope because as prominent Ukrainian um, scholar, Ruslan Fritak saying, uh, by canceling Russian culture, we are primarily solving the issue of our own security. We are not canceling any language. There is language of one specific culture that we're trying to destroy and doing genocide right now. It's completely different of saying that we're multicultural. And I think it is very important to highlight. What's also important to highlight is that we're not saying that someone needs to speak or think in some language, to be honest. Still, when I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming in Russian language, and I know this is true. I'm, I'm speaking Ukrainian language in my personal life for eight years, but I still have Russian roots in my head. So, and we cannot do the law for that. We cannot say that you cannot think this language. It's not possible. What we can do, we can do safe environment for people who are willing to think, speak Ukrainian. This is something that Ukrainian didn't have anywhere in the world. It's a very strange place. We have people who can speak English in their countries. We have people who can speak French in their countries and also their ex-colonies, but let's talk about this. But somehow we don't have safe space for Ukrainians to speak Ukrainian language. There is no Ukrainian needs for language. So I'm thinking that we need to remember that we can create safe place to help people to think in Ukrainian language, but also like all the documentation, we already have this law. Like all the documentation, all the official communication should be in Ukrainian language. Also universities, because when I was studying, we still had some Russian uh, sources. We still were talking in Russian. It was possible to discuss Ukrainian culture in Russian language. This is something that doesn't even, it sounds like funny right now. So I'm thinking that we need to remember, we 
we need to have very strategic idea of how we will put Ukrainian language on pedestal, because this is very important. Because Russian culture, the myth of great Russian culture is based on Russian language. They don't have anything else, but only Russian literature. Please remember that every time you think about Dostoevsky. Um, so let's talk also about, because this was actually a very great question, which each, each of us can do. And let's talk about this because I'm like, I'm very big fan of talking about practice, what I can do today, because all of our conversation, they're great, but what I can do today. So I have a couple of um, examples, what you can do. So firstly, just go and dive deeper, deeper. Watch Ukrainian movie, buy Ukrainian book, please buy Ukrainian books. And also, which is also very good, um, I think, example, give Ukrainian book to your friends, spread this. Read again Ukrainian um, program of Ukrainian literature. I'm doing that. It's so fun. I mean, it's fun and sad, of course, because, you know, Russia. But I think it's very important to review our history again. Just like dive deeper. Yes, it is work. Because again, decolonization, personal decolonization is not something that is very easy to do. I had this uh, talk with, with my friends about, you know, decolonization of Kyiv and um, our, like, you know, memories of Kyiv. So I was born and I was raised, uh, I wasn't born there, but I was raised in the street of Artema in Kyiv. So this was my, my place when I was born and it was like a place where I, I had all my memories with this place. But right now it is Sichivistelitiv. It is still in my memory of Artema. And I'm always trying to switch my head. And I know for sure we changed the name for that street, not for me, but for future generation who will never know what is this Artema. Who was this Artema and why we had this like factory basically there in what respect. So it is um, for me, decolonization is a um, crucial altruistic act. This is not for us right now. This is for future. We need to remember that. So when we are, we need to forget something. We need to forget our like memories. It doesn't mean that we need to do it aggressively. We need to respect and we need to understand that this is fine, that something, some part of your personal decolonization will be painful. This is normal because it's act of aggression that was with, done with us for centuries. So we need to remember that and be very patient. So please go deeper, go to Ukrainian culture, try to know more. And also one of my professor said in, in university that instead of writing some article, just go and do one page of Ukrainian Wikipedia, spread knowledge. This is very important. And I think we just need to remember that each of us, we need to do baby steps each day to destroy this Goliath. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, about last question, uh, a certain Ukrainian agency is price of thousands of civilian and military lives. And uh, Ukraine has been fighting against Russia, against Russian imperialism and totalitarianism for for hundreds of years. And today we told that uh, everyone can help in this fight. So, and my colleagues uh, told many important things. So what else is worth doing? So first of all, use all available means, tools to continue providing military support to Ukraine. Today, no one but the Ukrainian armed forces can stop Russia's armed aggression, and Mariam also told about it, and I agree. Uh, I am human rights defender, and of course we use non-violent methods, but now we can only protect people and human rights without weapons. That's why it's very important to continue push and support Ukraine in, uh, with military. Uh, next. Of course, our partners support Ukrainian victory. But what exactly does Ukrainian victory mean in the context of Russia's future? Uh, it's often said that the liberation of Crimea will end the war. It will not. There can be no victory without the liberation of Crimea. Yes, it's true. But where is the guarantee that after the liberation of Crimea, Russia will not bomb shell uh, Crimea from military, Russian military bases, as it did it after the liberation of Kherson, for example. Now Russia is trying to completely destroy Kherson along with the people there. 
And that's why very important for us to have honest discussions uh, about what needs to happen in Russia or to Russia for it to stop being a threat to international order and international security. What should Russia be like for the decolonization for many uh, regions to take place? And it's really important to explore all possible scenarios and be prepared for them. Uh, next, unfortunately, the Russian narrative about Crimea being historically uh, Russian is still widespread and influences political decision making. And everyone who is here today uh, can change it and counter Russian propaganda in all its dimensions. And many of them are doing it. Thank you very much for this. And last but not least, of course, but very important thing, keep in touch with Ukrainians in Ukraine. Tell their extraordinary <clears throat> and heroic stories. For example, only in January, Ukraine has returned more than 400 Ukrainian soldiers and civilians from captivity. Each story of these people deserves to be a movie or to be a book. It's, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. And these stories are not only about Ukraine, but it's important for everyone in different countries to understand the true values and that they are worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you very much. And because we are so efficient, thank you, <laughs> panelists. We have half an hour for questions. So let's take a couple at the time. So let's start here with Lady in Red. Um, I was hoping somebody will notice my scarf, you know, thank you. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name, um, I'm a Ukrainian. My name is Oksana. I'm currently doing an Obama Foundation Fellowship at Columbia University, but more proudly, I'm the CEO of an uh, organization called Teach for Ukraine. So I'm very biased towards Miriam's points about education. And I think my question would be directed um, to you. Um, it's about Ukrainians who were forcefully displaced by the Russian invasion and currently live outside Ukraine. And we're talking about millions from five to eight millions, maybe, you know, more potentially if the war will uh, continue. And very practically, I think uh, the real issue is also with helping them to decolonize their mindsets, because often I travel from in, um, outside, inside Ukraine. And, you know, you can hear in on the trains, you know, what content are they consuming, you know, like even kids, their parents, and they are also our ambassadors outside Ukraine, not Ukrainians in Ukraine, but those people who live currently abroad. So my question to you, what do you think should be Ukraine's, uh, like, you know, official policy or not towards helping um, Ukrainians who live abroad to decolonize their mindsets? Thank you. All right. Very good. Let's take another one. Please, young lady over there. Hi. My name is Kamila Hedayenko. I'm a Ukraine Global Scholars uh, Scholar, and I study uh, undergraduate uh, in Suwannee University of the South. And my question is actually related to Oksana's, and uh, it's concerning about uh, students uh, and other people who are currently abroad and concerning education and repopulation of Ukraine, because those are going to be two big issues. Lack of professionals who are like staying in Ukraine and returning to Ukraine. So uh, not only how do we help um, those who are abroad like start the process of decolonization, but how do we also sustain sustainably attract those people to come back home? Because like Ukraine Global Scholars has 250 people who have committed to come back and re rebuild and keep working there. What about others? How do we help them want to come back and work in Ukraine? Thank you. Gotcha. Okay, so I think these are nice related questions. Let's tackle them and then we'll move on. Anyone? Miriam, anyone? Okay, I, I will just answer. And um, so, what I think, I'm, I'm of course completely agree with you, Oksana. And uh, I also kind of had a funny story. I was uh, traveling uh, from Kiev to uh, Warsaw, and I was in the train, and one woman, uh, you know, chatting, you know, trains, um, even if you don't want to. So. Uh, and she was asking me, I was speaking with her in Ukrainian, and she was like, look at me, I'm like, why you have, why you speak Ukrainian? Like, you know, I'm Ukrainian. And she's like, I know. 
you are Hotsuka. That's why you look like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, exactly. Uh, this is this is explanation. And she thought that my name is also just kind of Hotsuka name, you know. So I think this is an um, important question. Um, I can also see how um, in this question there is a lot of frustration as well. And this is also we need to remember because I think it's part of the um, patient and remember that we have our own pace, all of us. This is the idea of the personal decolonization. We have different history of family. We have different, we are from different regions. So we cannot say that you need to like speak or think in Ukrainian language in three months or so. It's very depends. But what each, like I think all of us, we can do, we need to promote Ukrainian culture basically talk about this, basically create some meetings. So basically, I think the idea of creation civil society outside of Ukraine, you know, like, because this is something that happening already. Like a lot of Ukrainians see each other creating their own like volunteer um, centers and helping. I think it's important first thing just to continue to do something, not only about, so for example, sometimes people are asking me to do lecture about how bad is Russian culture. Let's not talk about Russian culture. There is a lot of that, you know, like too much of, too much. We can talk about Ukrainian culture. And I think it's not enough of talking about that. So for example, what can, what can be done? Uh, again, I'm giving you like some practice uh, example. Read one novel of um, Vasil Stefanik. It's like five pages and just discuss it together. I, I genuinely believe that like, one discussion with five people can give a huge help because I, why I'm saying Stefanik, because there is a stone cross at the novel and it's about migration. And I think it's very interesting for all. Sorry, it's not a novel. It's a, sto- a short story. Thank you. Novella. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's very important. And a lot of Ukrainians right now can feel something in, in that novella. Novella. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I think just to try to focus to bring that in, because I think very important here also to do the curiosity, to do the spark of curiosity. And I think it's much harder, of, co- of course, not with young people, but also with our relatives. This is for sure something that I guess our responsibility, each of us. So just dive deeper and like focus and do like, you know, instead of doing something broad, like instead of talking about all meaning of Ukrainian language in our culture. Try to be more specific because with specificity, it's easier also to find your own interest in the topic. This is something that I kind of give as an advice. And also just remember that outside of Ukraine, the pace of decolonization will be much slower. And this we need just to keep it in mind. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I think that's very great answer was in cultural angle, which is super important. But definitely there is economical angle, and uh, that is very important. That is something which definitely depends from the parliament, from the government. Of course, people will come back to Ukraine. Ukrainians will come back to Ukraine if they will have opportunities in Ukraine. If they will have opportunity to build business, to earn good money, to live good life, in this case, they will come back. If we will only try to attract people by just reminding them you should, you, you are Ukrainians, you should come back. Unfortunately, somebody will, but most not. So we need to create opportunities. We need to work. We need to change the country. That is so important. That is, that is obvious, but that is important. We shouldn't forget about this. And we need to create today possibilities to, 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 uh, to, for these people who are abroad to touch Ukraine, to be with Ukraine. That is something, again, we, everybody should do their job. We are, I found and run the biggest in Ukraine network of educational cultural centers, non-governmental, which called Goncharenko centers. We have 31 in the different areas of Ukraine, but also we have online and also of Ukrainian language. And we have today those who are joining our online from Germany, from Poland, and, and, and we should make more and more. So we need to give these possibilities for people. Or for example, when we were, it was before 2022, we had three centers, unfortunately, we needed to stop them. Kramatorsk, Kliman, and Kostantinivka in Donbass. And I can tell you, when we opened uh, Ukrainian language courses there, that was a lines of people, free of charge. Lines of people who wanted to come. But and for years, they didn't have this possibility there. So we just need to make this, to create the possibilities 
to do this. And definitely what we should not do, it's something which, uh, unfortunately, it was a big discussion in Ukraine. Like two weeks ago or so something about this, there were these expressions that uh, some people in Ukraine said, we need to stop to support Ukrainian refugees in Europe to make them come back to Ukraine. And to give this money back, it even was said by the president. So we need to say, to, 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 to we, we need in Ukraine to decide how to spend this money, which European countries, are, oh, in the United States too, but it's not so many Ukrainians here, like in Poland or Czech Republic or Germany or Romania, uh, that they are spending. I think this is the worst thing to say. The worst possible, first of all, even from a practical point of view, because most of these people, it's not Uchelante who drove through Tisa. It's just real women, children. And to take them to Ukraine means at least to feed them at, at the simplest way. We don't have these possibilities. We, all we have, we need to spend in, in military to fight. That's so important for us. Secondly, more, many of these people lived in the cities which are completely destroyed and occupied now. What should we say to family from Mariupol? Where should they come back? Where will they leave? And that is our like blessing today. One of the things which we should be thankful to our partners, that they welcomed our people, that they gave these possibilities to them. And our aim is not to threaten them. We can't think about these people as a kind of kripaki, as a kind of, you know, people who are dependent. They could, should go there or there, but they belong to Ukrainian state. It's not. In the real world today, states are competing for people. And to do this, they just cannot rely only on culture, history, and things like this, but they should create opportunities. In this case, people will come. In another case, not. Can I add? Any other things, please? Yeah, and one, one more example from my personal experience. Um, I work with many international organizations, UN, UN, Council of Europe, and so on. In many international organizations in Brussels, in uh, Strasbourg, in New York, and other other cities, I have seen how Russians, Russian, um, Russian, trying to recognize that they have suffered from the war as much as Ukrainians, uh, that they are also victims of this war, and only Ukrainians abroad will be able to say and prove that this is a lie. And only Ukrainians abroad can tell the real stories of victims. And I think it's very important because Russians now using all tools to like recognize it. So that's why uh, I think Ukrainians can help in both. Anything? Oh, no, let's, let's move on. All right, very good. Uh, very good. Young man right here and young lady back there. Thank you very much for talking today. My name is Volodymyr, and my question is to Pan Goncherenko. You mentioned that Ukrainian government is now kind of reversing the decentralization trend and moving towards more centralization. Could you elaborate on that? And uh, could you share just a couple of thoughts or reflections? Because most of us here, we are talking about external threat. But I would love to hear your perspective on uh, corruption or centralization and these issues. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Diana Lysenko. I'm the outgoing president of the Harvard Ukrainian Student Society. Um, my question is twofold. Uh, so the first part of my question is, what should we do as students at Western institutions to help decolonize Ukraine, um, apart from raising awareness and raising funds as we've been doing relentlessly over the past uh, two years. And my second part is probably even more important. What should the administration of our schools be doing or the leadership of our schools to help decolonize Ukraine? Because so far there's been, the response has been somewhat lackluster, uh, especially as compared to the response to the Israel-Palestine uh, war. Thank you. Thank you. That's two questions. Oh, yeah. So I have I had a direct question, so I, I will answer uh, this one. Uh, oh, it's a long conversation and we will need a lot of time. But uh, martial law, 
time is not the, the best time for democracy to flourish. It's clear. And there are natural limitations of democratic rights. They're natural in the time of war. But also, when the war continues, the long war has a lot of challenges. And one of challenges is these natural limitations are becoming more and more and more, and they are not any more natural. And if you will take any government in the world, there is no one, believe me as a politician, no one, wa no one wants to be asked. You also, don't, you also don't like when you are asked, what are you doing? Why you're here? Why you're there? But that is the idea of democracy, the, the control over the government. And it's very difficult to ask the government uh, during the martial law time. For example, in our parliament, we don't have questions in Darsan sessions, which was usually every week with the government for two years. Is it natural? I think not. I think it's just, a, they, they started to, to, to like this practice. They started to like when there is a national teleton where you can't hear anything, no questions, nothing. You can't be asked in the parliament. You can change the mayor. You can say what to do the here or there. You can say who from the parliament can go abroad, who cannot go abroad, what somebody who should, and, and so on and so on. That's about leverages. That's about influence. And everybody likes to have more power and to be less asked. Ukrainian government is not exception. That creates challenges. They are not, I, I can't say that they are already like huge and catastrophic. No. But if we will not speak about this, if we will not try to change this, we will not influence this, they will become worse and worse and worse. And, it sounds, and, and that is a very practical thing. Very practical thing, because I was telling to my colleagues from ruling party in the parliament two years, like a year and a half ago, when you're limiting the possibilities of the parliament to oversee, to supervise, when you're limiting media, when even if you are the best man in the world, you will have problems with corruption, because this is a part of the system. It's not just a law enforcement bodies. It's a media, it's opposition, uh, it's a civil, civil, civic society who should uh, supervise what's going on. But you need to give this possibility not to close all of them. And it's in your best interest. So, I, for example, if you will take a look at the decision of European Union, big thanks to them. They made a decision about 50 billion euros to Ukraine for four years. That's very important. And I hope this will be a good signal to the United States of America. By the way, answering your question, find your senators, find your congressmen. Do it. Do it. Because without this, we can erase the awareness about Ukrainian culture, but Ukraine would be destroyed. If this would not be made, find them all and speak to them and be with them very strict. No, do not play games. That's so important. You are having a unique opportunity here. All of you, you are ambassadors of Ukraine. You are, you are here. You have a unique opportunity to knock the doors, to push the doors, to speak with them. We need your support in this. It's something unique you can do. Without this, we would not survive. That's something you should understand and we should remember. Uh, so that, that's so important. So speaking about these 50 billions, there is a point in the decision that Ukraine should secure its pluralism, democracy. And this is the first time there is this point because they also see some challenges. So we need also in this area support of the... Of, of the West just to help to secure these values. Because once again, democracy, and we found it in Ukraine, it's the most pragmatical and practical thing it happened to be. Because small democracy can win over big tyranny. Small autocratic country will never win a big autocratic country. Any other takers? Yeah. Uh, uh, I first fully agree with Olexi on the first point. Uh, I, I, I talked about that in, 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 in my, in my uh, contributions earlier. So definitely, uh, uh, definitely uh, it, the elimination, the discontinuation of this um, United Telemarathon is long overdue. Uh, the uh, centralized, recentralizing attempts, so the, the, the uh, kind of uh, curtailment of centralization uh, reform of, of post Euromaidan is, is should, 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 should be stopped immediately. Uh, and uh, yeah, the Western world is watching. 
and and and, and uh, they, they 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 tend to be lenient toward Ukraine uh, because it's war. But but they are watching and they are taking notes and 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 they will not tolerate uh, uh, the, the uh, curtailment of democracy definitely. And 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 on the second point, uh, as far as I understand, it's a question not about American citizens but Amer- Ukrainian uh, uh, U- U- Ukrainian students in 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 American universities. So um, I believe one uh, important thing. Uh, um, Aside from rallying and um, and uh, 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 dissemination of knowledge, is contribution to the changes in your universities. So make Ukraine more present on your curricula. Uh, uh, as somebody who's be, who, uh, who's been teaching in in, uh, in in American universities for for the last two decades, including the last two years at at, at two of the best American universities, I know that uh, the presence of Ukrainian courses is still rather minimal. Uh, that Ukraine is still a, a pale shadow of what Russia is in American campuses, and and and, and Ukrainian uh, U- enrollment in U- U- Ukraine classes is 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 still uh, lagging behind enrollment in classes on a kind of more serious countries. Yeah, so change that. Enroll in Ukrainian classes. Of course, it it might you you might believe you know about Ukraine uh, more already. So why do you need that? You 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 need to to uh, to enroll in classes on other countries or in more serious stuff. Yeah, like like biochemistry or cybersecurity or or, or whatever it is that uh, fancy nowadays. Uh, but uh, but classes about about Ukraine need to be taught, need to be seen, need to be need to have a chance to become appealing to non-Ukrainians. So talk to your non-Ukrainian friends about why why they need to enroll in that class. Uh, demand that classes in Ukrainian language are, are, uh, are uh, established at your university. Uh, make sure that your friends uh, populate those classes because otherwise they'll be, they will be discontinued. So make change starting with, with where you are. Yeah, so close to you, uh, do it yourself, uh, encourage your, your, your non-Ukrainian friends to do it and then uh, 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 step by step, you, you, Ukraine will become kind of a normal country like Russia, like France, like Germany, like China, uh, present in 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 all uh, in in all uh, sets of dip- disciplines, starting f- uh, from uh, fr- from history and literature, and in with, with political science and so sociology and anthropology. So help do it. Uh, uh, there are there are people in, uh, educated already in the West, non-Ukrainians, uh, who are ready to teach those courses. Uh, help them find their jobs. Uh, so far, jobs continue to be coming towards Russians. So help them to, to come toward Ukrainians, demand that. So you can make the change. So answering the question um, about what Ukrainian students can do and what administrations can do. So firstly, I think it's important to remember that some people are thinking that they're exposed to Russian propaganda when they are in Russia. And these feelings make make you very vulnerable to Russian propaganda because uh, we can agree that they're pretty good in propaganda in every sphere and in the academic thought as well. So I think it's very important what Ukrainian students can do, try to decolonize also Slavic studies from the idea that this is Russian studies, that Russia is, you know, you don't need to... Um, learn Ukrainian culture, you just need to know Russian, all of that. So this is something that, you know, Ukrainians can do. And I, I kind of need also to appreciate the work that I know a lot of Ukrainian students are doing already. I completely uh, agree on that. For the administrations, and also very important, do not try to force the dialogue between Ukrainians and Russian on the same panels. This is not fight for, for brothers of brothers. This is power structure. There is power structure in this relationship. We need to help to raise Ukrainian voices, not because it's more popular, not because it is right now the main agenda, because for centuries, we knew everything about Russian culture. We need to help to raise this awareness. And just remember that there is there is a power structure and we need to help those who weren't heard before. Thank you, Miriam. Olga, anything you'd like to add? No, oh, I totally agree with my colleagues. So it's really clear. So before I take another question, I just wanted to encourage you in that, that don't underestimate the power and the need for awareness raising i know it's exhausting right time and time <clears throat> repeating the message is absolutely necessary very good um let's see a, a gentleman right there um a lady right here and uh, 
Thank you. My name is Oleksa Martinyuk. Uh, I'm with Rasm for Ukraine, uh, Ukraine on campus. So echo everything everyone has said about campuses. Um, but my question is for Olha. Uh, you outlined this, you know, robust, you know, proactive, um, you know, uh, tailored approach to public policy in Crimea for reintegration, you know, deoccupation, uh, decolonization. But how do you kind of engage, you know, members of government, parliament, you know, the community at large in Ukraine in convincing them that? You know, we need this large, tailored approach specifically for Crimea. Mm -hmm. One more question. One more question. Yep. Do you have to? We don't speak of propaganda enough. Decolonization has to be happening in minds, and it's multi-layered. And sadly, I see so much of this. Uh, I mean, Russian propaganda is everywhere and uh, they influence international affairs, they uh, interfere corporations, elections in so many countries. And we don't really understand we swim in this Russian propaganda. Now they even use AI. But we, we are trying to do United 24 is amazing, but it's not enough. We need more ideas. We need meanings. We need constructive ideas for Ukrainians to help overcome this process, to be aiming towards after the war is finished. And every strong country, every nation, every entity has uniting ideas and even myths. So what's your question? My question is how do we create more spaces for these ideas to flourish and be brainstormed about and just because it's on huge percentage war in minds. Understood. Okay, we have, let's do one more question from uh, Zoom audience. Thank you. Um, so we have questions on Zoom that are specifically about policies that I think you might be interested in weighing in on. Um, and so the first one is about Ukrainian higher education. How do you think this might be reformed, decolonized? Um, and the second is the approach, how can Ukraine most efficiently approach the veteran population increase in the post-war period, obviously, you know, this is going to be a population that expands dramatically. Um, so what policies would be the most beneficial? What challenges should Ukraine expect to face? Um, and how, and I'm adding this part, but how can this type of practice also be in, within the realm of decolonizing in policy? Thank you. All right, very good. Any takers, please? Just Olga. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. So about how we can engage uh, other institutions, organizations. So we have several um, dimensions or several platforms for this. For example, first of all, uh, it's uh, Crimea platform and one uh, the part of Crimea platform expert network of Crimea platform. It's very it's very big network of. Uh, Ukrainian and foreign organizations, and also uh, individuals. And we work uh, in uh, seven uh, thematic groups. It's non-recognition policy and sanctions, human rights and international humanitarian law, security, economy and environment protection, culture, heritage, humanitarian policy, and also restoration of the rights of indigenous people. Uh, so I think it's very uh, good opportunity uh, to work uh, and prepare a strategy for, for Crimea in different spheres. And now also we uh, work with Ukrainian universities with students. And it's really very interesting how students now uh, see future of Crimea. And we organize several conferences with Ukrainian students uh, on the uh, in international Crimea platform. So, and now many of them are very active and also participate in preparation of strategic doc documents. Uh, one more, I think recovery reserves that I mentioned before that was established last year also um, should be platform for this. But now, unfortunately, it's only for officials. It's like public uh, service, Državni uh, Slushbovci. But I think and I'm sure that we uh, need to spread this service and this uh, recovery service for all uh, people from NGOs, from business, for example, because many people, it, 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 and 
it's not only about Crimeans uh, who are forced to leave Crimea and now like IDP, but it's also about uh, other Ukrainians who also would like to work in deoccupied territories. It can help to decolonize, decolonize uh, these territories and help to reintegrate uh, Crimeans to Ukrainian space. So uh, I think we have this possibility and some of this use. And now we work with uh, government uh, to like to um, share this recovery service for for many categories of people who would like to be in this service. Thanks. Emily, uh, it turns out we didn't understand what the third question is about. Can you repeat it, please? No, the second one. Is there is a third one also? No, the first one, yeah? So there are two. Oh, there, there are, are two. two. Yes, oh, so we, 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 we were under the impression that there were three. Oh, okay, we are, we, we are rescued. Oh, okay, so let, let me start. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, higher education, uh, definitely, uh, definitely changes in curricula, uh, uh, definitely changes in, in practices of education, no less important. It's obvious how Russia should be kicked out of our curricula, Russo centuries should be replaced by Ukrainian centuries, but also more creative approach to education, uh, more independent, uh, more student oriented, uh, uh, people oriented approach to education. That would be our, our decolonization. Yeah. Uh, definitely uh, f uh, ruthless fight, fight on plagiarism. Uh, that would be our uh, uh, decolonization. Uh, uh, fight against uh, nepotism and, uh, and, 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 and uh, omnipotency of, of, of rectors of, or, or, or directors. So there should be more democracy in, 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 in higher education. So uh, that would be our de uh, uh, de uh, decolonization. So uh, all these things which are not, uh, not usually uh, uh, affiliate, associated with, with decolonization because uh, it's obvious that there should be less Russia. It's obvious that there should be less, uh, 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 less dead Ru Russian white man yeah on the programs and, and less russian language and and less russian uh, russian history and monuments but it's 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 not necessarily obvious to everybody why, why there should be less uh, ideally no plagiarism at all yeah so uh, let's do that and uh, veterans um uh, Definitely veterans should become uh, the most esteemed uh, strata in Ukrainian uh, stratum in Ukrainian society. Definitely the, uh, the, the whole Ukraine uh, atos and, 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 and social practices of Ukrainian society should be changed toward recognition of, 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 of their contribution to Ukrainian survival and, 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 and democ democracy and prosperity in European future. So, of course, easier said than done. Uh, that means that Ukraine should be a society where, um, in principle, there is no strict line between veterans and non-veterans. Uh, if uh, if uh, uh, the conscription uh, or uh, contract service is fair, uh, there is no need to be so grateful to veterans being not one of them. We can be all veterans in, in, in different ways. Yeah. At least all, all, all men can be veterans or except for those who, 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 who have very serious reasons not to be. So it's better to be like Israel, uh, where uh, there is no special, uh, veneration of, of veterans, but there is special duty to be, uh, uh to, 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 uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to contribute to, 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 to the national security. So I believe, uh, that, uh, Currently, Ukraine is a, uh, is a, is a very serious uh, kind of threshold. We are discussing the new uh, law on mobilization. We are, uh, uh, we are discussing the new rules for, uh, for responding to the huge challenge of war. Yeah. So, and, 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 and there is a lot of concern in society that still those who are veterans will, will be left veterans with some social benefits for them, with, with, with a lot of belief in them. But, but the rest of society uh, uh, will be allowed not to contribute to that. So, and, and veterans are those who are now perceiving this as deeply unfair. So we need to address this challenge. We need to make it less unfair in, in the eyes of veterans. So veterans should be asked what is fair with regard to veterans first and foremost. Completely agree. And uh, I'm just thinking that I need to add something about the, the, the veteran politics. So. There is already some um, activity that people are doing and some veterans are already create, creating centers about that. So um, I think I can talk about non-government organization that was founded uh, in 2023. The name is Princip. It was founded by Masina Yem, which happened to be my brother. Um, 
And I'm thinking that this is very important, not only because he's my brother, but I genuinely think that this is very important for our society, not only for veterans. So what they're doing, and they're also trying to help veterans from the perspective of law, because, you know, when you, my brother specifically, he faced that after he was injured, that it's not very easy to be a veteran, even if you're like already not fighting. It's pretty, pretty com complicated and you don't feel like you um, have respect from the state. And this is something that all veterans need to feel every day, that they're respected, not only by people, but also by the state. But second, what they're also doing, they're sharing um, studies that they're, they're, uh, they're doing the interviews with veterans. <laughs> they're sharing information for civil society. So I think it's also important for civil people to be ready to understand what does it mean to be a veteran and be prepared and prepare yourself to understand that our society will be different after war. Of course, it's like, it's very generalizing, but we need to understand that there will be new and very important part of society that we need to account to. And we also need to understand them and their needs. And this is, I think, um, basically our our purpose. We need to work on that as a civil society, as a people who are not on the front line. We're not saving Ukraine right now. Anyone else wants to weigh in on these two? On those three questions, rather. <clears throat> the end of time. We respect the time. Emily, we're at the top of the hour. What do you say, the Grand Master? <laughs> reception is coming up, conversations can continue. But I would like, if I may, though, to give each one of our panelists a right of lust. Not lust, that sounds horrible. <laughs> 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 Summarizing words before the reception. How Late. about this? Yes. Latest. Um, Olha, how would you like to start? A lot of pressure. Yeah. So I think I need the time for all right, some, someone ready for their, for their the moment of sound? Yeah, sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Politicians first. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm ready. I will be short. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, like, you know, I was watching all the time on these pictures. And, and I was interested, I mean, what, 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 what like, they... The beautiful pictures. I even asked who did it. There was some Ukrainian artist, I was told. He from Maria Kiev. Maria Kinovich. Maria Kinovich, thank you very much. That's amazing. That's, but I think it's so symbolical too. I see three like different things here, right? We see the rabbit, which is probably running away. From our uh, conversations, it looks like this is idea to run away from Russia and from Russian... In any way, Russian was here a little bit dominating our discussion, which I found a little bit pity of, but, but it's, it's reality, it's just understandable. Second is uh, the bird, which is flying up. That's about, I think, wider picture that I like very much. And also from the hate, you can shit on Russians, which is also good. <laughs> that's, uh, that's great idea. And the third picture is about I don't know, is it some flower or just a flower? I don't know. But I like very much this idea to grow through. To, 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 to grow through. I mean, just don't forget, this is not the first huge challenge in Ukrainian history and history of our nation. This is not the first big war. And that's not only Russians we, have, we fought in centuries. We came through many, many very bad times, you know, and challenges, but we grew through it. And now our seats are everywhere, here in the United States of America, in Poland, in Europe. And that is fantastic. That is strength. That is strength. We need to secure this, to be strong, to plant our seeds. And I think we will have a fantastic harvest and the world will be more in blue, yellow colors. That is something I'm absolutely sure about. And I have one last, last ask to you. Just, we were speaking what to do, what you can do. I can tell you, maybe it's a small thing, but believe me, people see it. Every time, like Ukrainians and I'm now coming back home from some, coming out from the country on business trips, they're saying it's much less Ukrainian flags in the cities like it was before. Much less. Much less here in the a year ago, I was here. There were many more Ukrainian flags. 
less in France, less in Poland, less in Germany. I just want to ask you to do one thing, to check do you have Ukrainian flag in your window and to take three more flags and to go to your friend, I don't know, to your boyfriend or girlfriend family and to ask them to put it. That is something which you can do right now to have more blue yellow here and in the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. I must confess, I, I have no Ukrainian flag in my window, so I, I, I have a lot to work. Uh, um, See? Yeah. Uh, even, even, even some of, uh, some among us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I, 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 I want to say about something else. I, I'm so happy to have this audience, auditorium packed. Uh, and uh, to see so many unfamiliar faces. Normally, when I came uh, to Harvard, to Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and I've been there uh, here a lot, uh, I al almost knew everybody by, 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 by face, maybe not by name. Uh, the, same, the same people tended to attend uh, uh, URI events, or, or at least maybe events with, with my participation. Uh, and now there is a so, uh, such a huge sea on unfamiliar faces. And from what I hear, no, uh, far from all, all, all people here are Ukrainians or, or, or related to Ukraine. So, which is great. And, 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 and we, we, all, we also know that there are a lot, a, a lot of people that are out there. Yeah, so uh, streaming in uh, by, 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 by Zoom. Uh, so this is new and this is fantastic. Of course, uh, of course, this means that there is a lot of need for Ukraine knowledge and also uh, the knowledge of, 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 of uh, decolonization. But what is, what is equally important is that there is a second world or the third world in theory and practice. Yeah, so uh, there has been a lot of talk about decolonization at, uh, and at some point I started feeling like there is too much talk about decolonization. What new can we, can, can we all say? So um, it, it seemed, seemed to be going in circles. And, and, and finally, I, 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 I hear here this very important dimension of practice. So there has been a lot uh, said here, which, 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 which is a kind of a recipe for, for, for all of each of us to implement. So uh, go write a letter to put out a Ukrainian flag. Uh, uh, go write a letter to your, to, to, to your uh, uh, congressman or, or senator. Uh, demand Ukrainian classes and, uh, at your university. Talk to your friends and about why should, uh, should, 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 should attend those classes or demand together with you. Uh, so donate, uh, uh, donate to Ukraine causes such as Razum or, or, uh, or many other good causes. Uh, so uh, there is a lot we can do practically. But of course, uh, the result we all hope for will be, will be change in the world, but also change in us, in how, in how we, be, we behave, in, in how we think. Uh, so far, we are still fighting against Russia. Ideally, we should forget about Russia. We should live in a world in which Ukraine doesn't need a Russia and, 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 and doesn't suffer from the shadow of Russia. Of course, uh, it, it is not possible right now because we are, every day we are reminded by Russia uh, of its uh, horrible existence. But ideally, we will be there. So let's work for that. Mm, I guess we need to focus on tools. First tool is knowledge. And we all need to remember that, that with this knowledge, we can make changes. We need to read more. We need to write more. We need to spread and talk with our friends more. But what is also important is the second tool. We need tools on the war zone. We need weapon. Please go and do something so we will have more weapon. Thank you, and I can only add to what my colleagues have said. So the war will be long. Uh, it will take a lot of energy. And we have to fight for Ukraine every day, for weapons for Ukraine every day, and continue the way of decolonizing ourselves. So, but at the same time, we must find the energy to do it. And I think for this, we need solidarity and, and support from each other. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you all. And even though you have been disobedient audience, I'm still going to ask you to clap one more time. Give a round of applause to our panelists and Slava Ukraine. Hello and Uh, if you'll grant me a couple more minutes um, before we uh, exit to the reception, I'm honestly, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to see so many people here. As I said, you know, this was a conversation of something I was personally interested in. I wanted to have a conference about how to talk about decolonizing. I didn't actually think 150 people also wanted to have that conversation in this room, plus 200 more people on Zoom. So um, thanks, especially to this panel for talking about such a hard topic in a way that makes us not feel totally disinspired, but instead motivates us to action. I, I, I can't wait to see where these conversations go. Um, I just want to give a couple of words of gratitude. This conference has been, uh, there's been so much support, first of all, from the Temerty family and the Temerty Foundation for their funding of this program, um, establishing it, supporting it through these past five years. Thank you, Sahi Pohi, for your support. Um, from the Institute for the Conference of this program. I'd like to give special thank yous to Kostya Bondarenko, Megan Duncan-Smith, and Tamish Holowinski, who have given a lot of time and energy in making this conference happen, especially in making the Zoom happen, too. Um, MJ Scott has devoted a lot of time for conference support. My student team is Diana Nichvolda, who's been involved from the start to the finish. And today and yesterday, Christina Vorbsikian, Vlad Wallace, Maria Kulczycki, Alejandro Martin helped from the day-to-day -day practical things. Thanks also to Nadia Chervinska and Diana Gore for helping out unexpectedly on Thursday night. Um, I want to thank Olha Alexic and Volodymyr Dibrova, my colleagues at HERI, for their support of the conference, as well as our amazing publications team who put together the book fair outside. Um, let's take some of this advice and go pick up some copies of new Ukrainian literature in new English translations. Um, and I especially want to thank our Ukrainian interpreters, Alex and Irina, who worked through both days of this conference fully to make these panels accessible. Um, and let's give one final thank you to our artist, Maria Kinovich, who actually attended most of this panel um, and who made these wonderful illustrations come to life so beautifully. Um, thanks, everybody, so much for being here. Thank you to everyone in Ukraine who inspires us to keep talking about Ukraine and thinking about Ukraine and making Ukraine this foundational place for thinking about the future, too. So please join me outside. Um, for our conference speakers, anybody who's still here, we're going to take one more group photo. So if you could meet outside together, we'll do that. Everybody else is free to uh, mill about the concourse and look at our publication tables. Thank you so much.